Yashwant has uh, done his bachelor's in Indian Institute of Management, which is one of the best institutes. And then he's done his, um, he worked at Neuromorphic Lab in IISE, again, one of the best in institutes of science in uh, India. And then right now he's doing his, he's actually finished his PhD in Western Sydney University. And he's currently postdoctoral researcher at ICNS. His research focuses on scalable neuromorphic machine learning, uh, mach machine learning architectures. Very excited to hear about these architectures from you, Yashwant. Over to you. Thank you so much, Aruna. Um, thank you. I, ho I hope everyone had a cup of coffee uh, before, before this session. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a, a bit about something which is a little bit different from what what you heard um, during the morning session. I'm going to talk about neuromorphic engineering. I'm going to talk about, um, he asked me to smile, stop and smile. So I just had to do that, <laughs> sorry. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about spiking neural network architectures. Um, and I'm going to talk about a possible roadmap for the future for, for TinyML at, at Edge. Um, this, this is my talk title, Optimized Event-Driven Neural Network Architectures. Um, just would want to first um, credit uh, uh, my collaborators. Uh, Dr. Saeed Afshar is, is the lead on this project. In fact, he was supposed to give this presentation but uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances, he couldn't, he couldn't be here today. But he sends his sincere apologies. Um, and um, Professor Andre Von Sheik, he's the director of ICNS. Uh, ICNS is, is sort of slowly becoming the largest research center or research lab uh, for neuromorphic engineering um, in general. And we are based at um, Western Sydney University in Sydney. Um, and, and most of this work has been conducted as part of my PhD thesis under both uh, Andre as well as, as uh, Saeed. And uh, Dr. Ali Merabi, uh, who is our FPGA um, hardware engineer, he's also a postdoctoral researcher at, at ICNS. And, and um, he also contributed a lot uh, in, in building these systems in, in hardware. OK, uh, the problem at Edge, we've, we've heard uh, a lot of amazing research today morning about, about inference on, on Edge. It's, it's, it's amazing that we are able to run transformers on, on mobile phones. Uh, uh, which is which is wild, um, according to me. Uh, but what about learning at edge? Uh, what are the problems that we uh, face when we try to perform this this sort of training the neural network at edge? The first and foremost uh, reason is is error back propagation, uh, gradient descent is computationally expensive. We need we need GPUs. We need we need a lot of compute power to to perform perform this this magic, uh, uh, which is which is error back propagation to train the networks. Second, it requires a symmetric backward pathway. Um, uh, to, to pass the gradients. And these gradients are usually full precision values. You may have uh, heard of quantization, but, but research shows that even though you can quantize the, the forward propagation pathway uh, while training, you still need full precision floating point values while, while doing the, the training. And the symmetric backward pathways is basically to, to do the entire for propagation, calculate your loss, and then and then come back with each layer from the end back to the beginning and and, and passing those gradients. It's almost like another for propagation operation, but from in the, in the reverse direction. Back propagation requires precise and synchronous orchestration of gradient calculation. What do I mean by synchronous here? It means that I have to first take the input calculate the activations in the first layer, 
make sure that I calculate the activations of all the neurons in the first layer, then pass it on to the next layer, and then so on, and then so on, and again do the same backwards from the end to back, and do the weight updates. It leads to uh, what some people call a locking effect of your, of your system. So when you're, when you're trying to actively infer as well as simultaneously train your system, if you imagine you have like a chip which is running at edge and it's, it's being trained, it's maybe it's receiving some feedback in the form of reinforcement or, or, or some other feedback, and it is trying to, one, cater to the inputs so that it generates the outputs, it's a real-time system, but then it also needs to perform this, these updates, which again would, would need some time. And, and the longer your networks are, the larger your models are, this, affects, this effect sort of becomes more and more uh, pronounced. And then the von Neumann bottleneck. Um, we need, we need co-located uh, memory and compute in hardware. Uh, writing and reading from memory is expensive, uh, and uh, and and yeah, it's it's, it's a problem. Uh, we have we have emerging materials uh, like memristors and and some three D stack memory and and, and co located um, memory and compute um, uh, materials coming about, and hopefully they'll they'll solve this problem. It's possible for smaller networks, but not scalable. What do I mean by this? It's again, goes back to the whole uh, synchronization of, of calculating the activations and then calculating the gradients. We need to, if the networks become larger and larger, it becomes harder and harder to actually perform this training um, in, in, in hardware. Um, the result, most solutions are often inference at edge uh, rather than learning at edge. I've seen uh, another talk scheduled today, which, is, uh, which I think from, from um, another, another uh, company here, which is attempting um, on-chip learning. Um, but most of the solutions, existing solutions, are only inference at edge rather than learning at edge. Um, and why would we need something like that? We would need, um, at, at some point, we, 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 we're trying to achieve this ubiquitous machine learning. I hope everyone here is, is, wants to do that. We need to be able to deploy these things uh, in places which don't have a lot of power, and you would want to be able to fine tune your models to specific um, use cases as soon, once you take it out of training and then you deploy it at edge, suddenly the, the, the probability distribution of your, of your data sets change. Maybe there is drift, you would like to account for that, and maybe you just need uh, these in, in, in the situations that, that you're targeting. So what are we gonna do about it? We can look at nature, um, we can look at nature, nature is, the, the biological nervous system is sort of like the only technology we know that it is, and we can be certain that it is intelligent. So we can look at what nature does and maybe take some lessons from it. I just want to understand the lay of the land here. How many of you uh, are familiar with the term neuromorphic engineering? Just maybe a show of hands. Uh, how many of you are familiar with spiking neural networks? Okay, I'll, okay, thank you. Um, what are some of the things that nature does or, or nature has evolved uh, in these biological nervous systems which, which sort of um, make them so power efficient? Uh, one of the examples that we, we like to give at ICNS is, is a dragonfly lives on just 10 mosquitoes per day and it is able to traverse challenging of wind conditions and, 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 and be able to fly around uh, uh, in, in a wild environment, which is, which is always new, right? It's, 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 not, it's not in distribution uh, uh, data, always. Um, 
so 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 what are the some of the things that we can we can see from from nature one is we see in across all the biological nervous systems there is this sort of like a communication sparsity what do i mean by that spikes uh, you see sparsity in terms of the connections as well as in terms of uh, uh, the way data is transferred between uh, different parts of the brain or different parts of the nervous system. Uh, you see spikes as being used as the main mode of, uh, of communication, which are sparse. Second is computational sparsity. What you see is also, again, some parts of the brain are performing a computation, and other parts of the brain can stay silent when not required. The overall number of neurons that you would see in, uh, which are active in a brain are a far smaller percentage than the total number of neurons in, in nervous systems, which is not the case when, you, when we look at deep learning uh, artificial neural networks, right? Each and every neuron has to generate an output during the entire forward propagation. And there is massive parallelism. What do I mean by that? Every neuron is always on and it's running. No neuron is sort of waiting for like a wave of, of, of information flow from first layer to second layer, third layer, fourth layer, and then maybe like, oh, you've, you've got loss and then the loss has to travel back. The final one, and I think which is the most important one, is local independence. Each neuron or synapse in, in, in a nervous system is sort of independent of other uh, uh, elements in the system. So each synapse has access to some bit of information about, about what it has recently done or maybe what's around it. And there are some feedback, biofeedback signals which, which, which uh, sort of give some signals to what its experience was. But Beyond that, a neuron cannot access what is the synaptic weight of another neuron in a, in a system. And, but we, we need that in, in deep learning. We, the weight updates at one neuron depends on, 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 the, on the output or the weights of other neurons. So this is where neuromorphic engineering would, would come into the picture, depending on which person you ask, everyone is going to give you like a different definition of what neuromorphic engineering is. The Carver Mead, who coined the term, uh, uh, implied that it was about developing analog um, hardware that emulates spiking neurons or biological um, systems, and with which then we can exploit the, uh, the, uh, the low power nature of, of, of biological systems. But now it has come to become sort of this broader uh, area which, which basically deals with developing any technology which is, is inspired by, by biological nervous systems um, so as to exploit, again, their, their whole um, benefits uh, that they get due to their design and, and, and the way they function. Um, so. Again, a little bit on communication sparsity. One of the best examples of communication sparsity is, 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 uh, is from the, these sensors called event-based sensors. Uh, they're also called as neuromorphic cameras. Um, they sort of work a little bit different from, from conventional frame-based uh, sensors, which, which capture frames of information. Um, so you have, typically you have a frame rate, whereas these sensors which are, um, inspired by, by the, the retina, the, the retina and, and ganglion pathway, they only detect changes, temporal contrast changes. So whenever at a pixel, the light intensity changes beyond a threshold. If it goes up, it sends a positive event. If it goes down, it sends a negative event. And each pixel is, again, independent. You can see all, almost all of the, the, uh, the attributes that we were talking about uh, just now. It's, it's parallel. You don't have frames. Whenever a pixel sees a change, it's, it sends across uh, the events. Um, there is no dependence between neighboring pixels, so you can get asynchronous uh, uh, data from, from the sensor. And, and it's, 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 again, it's, it has the parallelism inbuilt 
and everything. So we can encode information in spikes. We can do it by using the spike rate or the number of times you send an event and you can use to, you can use that count of number of spikes per, per second as, as a way to encode information. You can use the timing of the spike to, to encode information. And you can, and there are like a couple of other population encoding and, and other ways to, to, to encode this information in spikes. And when you use these spikes, which are just binary pulses, uh, we, get, we get a few benefits when, when we, are, we are designing hardware around, around these systems. And another thing that you usually see in these systems is spike only when necessary. If you don't see a change, don't spike, don't generate data. Because if you have data, you have to process that data, which costs, again, energy. Generating that data, again, costs energy. So spike only when necessary. When nothing is changing in the scene in front of you, don't generate data, and you don't have to do any computation. And, and neuromorphic sensors, the, 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 the growing in, in, in popularity. Um, there's, a, there's a new CVPR workshop, which is specifically um, designed for, for event-based solutions on, on event-based cameras. And, um, and also due to, due to the way that they're, they're designed, they, they offer uh, uh, low power, high dynamic range, uh, and, and, and a pretty fast uh, temporal precision, pretty, pretty high temporal precision. But in the end, timing is key, uh, even in these sensors. Uh, there is no free lunch. We, we probably are reducing the precision of the data being transferred, but you will still have to have the precision in timing. Uh, that's not going to go away. So the higher the precision of the timing that we can use, the, the uh, higher resolution of data we can, we can transfer. Innovation and Prophecy are, are the two leading companies right now which are making uh, these cameras. Um, and, and I, I don't know of one more company probably which, which is doing it, but, but um, check it out. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool and maybe it may be useful for, for, for people trying to develop vision-based uh, applications at, at, at Edge. And, 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 and basically the way it works is you're not going to generate any data when it's not changing and only when, it, when you see uh, this, is, this is the log intensity of, of the light falling on a pixel and when, it, when you see an increase, you, you've, you have spikes and then again, only when you see sort of like a, a decrease, you see, you see off spikes. Whereas if you want to do the same thing with, with, with regular cameras, you need like really high frame rate to capture the signal with, with high fidelity. Computational sparsity, which is also important. Now that if you have communication sparsity, if you have spikes, you can now do computation sparsely. Uh, we can perform computation asynchronously. I'm going to run my model only when I receive data. Only at the moment I receive a spike is only when my computational element is going to spring into action. Otherwise, it's silent. And what is it? useful for, it's, it's basically in, in, in these specific cases where you have long periods of boredom with sudden bursts of activity, which is what animals have, have been evolved uh, to do. They, they have to be ready to face any threat which suddenly springs in, in, in the wild, right? So, so if, you're, if you're looking at a CCTV camera footage or if you're looking at, if you're just monitoring a, a motor for, for anomaly detection, and if, if the signal is not changing by, by sampling and, 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 and computing what is, what is your prediction on that signal is, is sort of pointless. And you would want to do it only in the region where there is, there is some significant change in the signal. And you would want to capture that and, and, and perform an operation during that. And you would save on all this time during which the signal is not really changing, not much of interest is happening in that signal. So you sort of like deny any computation to be, uh, to, to, to be performed during that period. And sensors like event-based cameras solve this at the, the, at the sensing end. They generate data only when there are changes, but 
we need we need similar capabilities at the processing end of things. So we need our networks to be able to asynchronously process data, and if there is no change, not perform um, uh, any computation. So again, compute only when necessary. That's that's the that's the idea. And local independence and parallelism, which sort of like go hand in hand together, uh, and and in in some circles we call that. Uh, local learning versus global learning. Again, different definitions based on people who you ask. Uh, there, are, there are certain camps, if you talk to computational neuroscientists, they would say oh, a synapse is the smallest entity that is, that is supposed to be local. It only has access to its, um, its pre and post synaptic uh, times uh, and, and nothing else. Uh, global learning is again, you know what's happening at every other part of your network and you would use that to, to sort of change or update the parameters of your local unit. So again, scalable network architectures that can be decomposed into these entities that can operate independently is useful. Why? Because we can club multiple chips together and make them work together as long as each and every independent uh, element is able to perform independently, even if some of the elements stop working, the others can take over. That's the, that's the idea. And obviously, the smaller your entity, the better, uh, and the similar, the better, because you can reuse your components. And they're fault tolerant, again, if, if you have any of the components stop working, you can, they can take over. So what do we propose? Uh, Event-driven neural architectures. What do I mean by that? Event-driven, again, uh, it means they're asynchronous. So we're dealing with spikes. You get input events, you get output events. Everything is spike-based end-to-end, and each layer only uh, performs any computation when there is an input. When there is a spike, you perform some action at each input. Neural, you all almost all of you are familiar with what, what having neurons does. It, it makes your learning distributed and it makes your learning scalable because these are repeated entities that you can, that you can build in hardware. What about architectures? Architectures, again, comes back to com convolutional networks or transformers. So these architectures, which, which give some compositional and, and inductive priors to your, to your network so that they learn the features depending on the domain that they are applied to. So once we have a learning rule which is local in nature and which can be uh, applied to these large um, architectures, then we can have like we can we can make uh, networks with these like we do with backpropagation. The problem is spiking neural networks are not they're, they're not so friendly with with differentiation. The spikes, they, they don't like differentiation. There are some uh, existing solutions to do, to perform backpropagation on spiking neural networks, but they're usually uh, replacing the thresholding function with, 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 a, with an approximate function, and, and these are called surrogate gradient descent, uh, surrogate backpropagation. If, you, if you're interested, do uh, look them up. There are some amazing, um, work in that area, but they still, you would need GPUs to train these, uh, these networks, and then you can, you can deploy them on neuromorphic hardware, which are, which are built to emulate these spiking neural networks. Um, it's an active area of interest. Um, and if you look at, 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 the, at, at the whole SN and different kinds of SNNs out there, uh, you see, you, you broadly see uh, this sort of classification where they're, they're using rate coding or temporal coding where rate is again the number of spikes that you generate in unit time becomes your your input or your output uh, you can you can take all of your artificial neural networks convert it into a spike rate based uh, spiking neural network and it would just work on on many of the available neuromorphic hardware temporal coding is is where the information is is encoded in in spikes which is useful for for time series classification tasks or, or, or uh, tasks which involve time. 
And then again, you have like back propagation. There is this spiking SNN torch and other libraries which can do uh, this sort of like training for, for, for spiking neural networks. And there are methods like STDP, which, which are used to perform local learning. And, I'm, and I'd like to add one more dimension to this, this, this whole uh, uh, system of SNNs is, is being biorealistic versus being biosimplistic. A lot of people want their spike neural networks to resemble as much as possible to biology. I mean, biology has like a lot of quirks. It has it 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 tries to find uh, shortcuts due to due to evolution, due to due to the material that they are working with, and so it has developed a co really complex system. It's a it's a it's a very complex uh, dynamical system. But what we can do is we can abstract these spiking neural networks. We can remove things away from these spiking neural networks which are not required. And we can, we can reduce the complexity of these spiking neural networks, but still retaining the essence of them to, to use these models. Uh, this, is a, this, this is a comparison chart of how many um, number of flops you would need to implement different models of spiking neurons and, and, and sort of their biological plausibility. But these days, most people just use this integ leaky integrate and fire neurons, uh, which are very efficient. They capture most of the phenomena that you would want. Um, it works. What we did was we, we used something called as time surfaces, which is nothing but you get an event, it goes up, and then it decays after it's like a um, it's like an RC circuit, um, and and we call this time surfaces or memory surfaces. It's uh, it's it's common in in even based vision literature, um, using these traces uh, uh, to to capture the context of your input because you're getting these discontinuous pulses. So what we do is only when there is an event, we we capture the context. Uh, which is which is these traces at each input, and then we obviously have like a weights. We do a dot product operation, which gives you like a cosine distance, and we check it with uh, with the threshold of the neuron. And uh, how am I doing with time? Um, I can't see the time. Ten minutes. Okay, I'm I'm going to wrap it up. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up uh, quickly. Uh, we use these uh, uh, these neurons using winner take all, which is again uh, uh, where you have you pick one neuron as a winner, and 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 that neuron spikes, and everything else uh, stays silent, which is again important to generate a sparsity in your activation. So at most, at each layer, there is only one uh, uh, winner neuron. It is sort of similar to people who are familiar with. With spiking neural networks, uh, uh, um, uh, EI balanced network, where uh, if if, a new, if if population excites uh, too much, it, it it is going to get inhibited by an inhibitory population. So these are the kind of uh, networks. Uh, this was work uh, from Saeed Afshar, um, where he used neurons like this to perform unsupervised feature extraction uh, using very simple um, local learning rules. Um, uh, this presentation is going to be uploaded, so you can you can check out the paper. Um, and uh, what's 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 special about about these networks is 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 that is there is like we all know we use weights um, for for uh, for parameterizing our our networks. Uh, in this case, we also use thresholds as as parameters. So they are trainable parameters. Um, they they learn sort of the the variance of of the distribution each neuron is representing. Each neuron can be almost imagined as as a, as, a, as a cluster where the weights of the neuron uh, become the mean of that distribution of uh, of of. Uh, input context for which the neuron spikes, and the threshold sort of becomes uh, the variance of, of of that distribution. And using these neurons, we can we can uh, perform supervised learning. Uh, you give a label, so a label is 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 again in the form of a spike. Uh, if you have class one happening at time t, you're going to have like a label spike at time t. 
and uh, what the the neurons are going to do is they're going to try to move towards that context the weights are going to be pushed towards that context so that the neurons are going to learn that and this is the this is a fundamental um, algorithm which is spike timing dependent uh, uh, threshold adaptation um, where the thresholds are used to make neurons become more receptive or less receptive and by by doing this uh, we can we can make networks which look like this where you can have deep uh, spiking neural networks which can be trained without using back propagation and only um, <laughs> binary uh, event signals um, and, 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 and the whole working principle is basically the winner take all within the layer is going to promote competition among the neurons. So they try to learn as different features as possible within the layer. And uh, there are some local attention signals which are carried from the next layer to the current layer by just saying, oh, something spiked in the next layer. That must be important. And all the neurons in the current layer sort of are going to try to support that spike in the next layer. No, no information about which neuron in the next layer or the weights of the neurons in the next layer is passed around. It's just like a single unitary signal which comes back, says something in the next layer has spiked. With that, um, uh, I will show you a few results. Uh, let me show something which is intuitive. So this is the input spikes. Those are the spikes sent to the model. And these are the target spikes. Uh, this is called Oxford spike pattern. It's a, it's a, it's a building in, in Oxford University. Um, and you're basically trying to make the network learn to predict these spikes when this random input is given. So it's basically learning the correlation between uh, each of these spikes and what is the context here. And this is, this is the, uh, the result of, of Odessa. And you can do all sorts of um, different things. This is to show uh, it works on MNIST. It's not really uh, 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 a big deal. Uh, this, is, this is the hidden layer. So we have converted the MNIST digits into, into um, spikes using latency coding. Um, and these are, these are sort of the weights uh, or receptive fields in, in the output layer. This is trying to classify words out of, out of a Morse code. Morse code is just like dots and dashes, which is very much like spikes. It's, 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 it's a continuous time classification task. This is a classification of audio uh, spoken digits uh, converted through, again, like a neuromorphic uh, cochlear model and convicts, and then based on the spikes, it's, it's predicting what is the, what is the digit being uh, uttered. How deep is deep? Currently, we don't have um, uh, any data set to, to actually check, because, because all these layers are, are trying to increase the time for which they're, they're looking at the data. So it's, it's hierarchical, both in spatial sense as well as temporal sense. So as you go deeper and deeper into the layers, you're, you're looking at longer and longer time constants. Uh, it's inconclusive. Probably we would need like a good data set. We don't have good data spiking data sets at the moment. Uh, we are also working on that. Um, advantages of Odessa. Again, it, it does online continuous learning. Uh, it learns uh, hierarchical spatial temporal features at, at different time scales. It's an end to end spiking architecture. It only uses spikes uh, for communication and computation is also um, event driven. So if one of the layers in between doesn't detect the feature, so let's say you're looking at, 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 a, at a video of, of a car, and if the edges don't look right, you don't have any spikes going beyond the first layer. Your, your network is silent uh, for the later part of the network. Uh, and it's gradient-free learning. Uh, it's modular and extensible. You can sort of like just add layers like you do in all of the deep learning uh, libraries and just uh, give a spike train for input and output, and it trains. This is a digital implementation of Odessa using just registers, not using RAM, um, so that as, as a proof of concept uh, that it can all neurons can be run parallelly without without doing any sort of synchronization, um, and it can it can be run asynchronously. I'll stop there. Um, 
this is the conclusion. You, you have input events, you have label events. Odessa figures out what needs to be the weights in between to, to perform that, that um, classification. Um, yeah, it's still far out in the future because we still don't have these emerging materials. We can't, we can't scale these, these networks uh, in hardware. In software, because these are asynchronous and parallel networks, we can't run them on CPUs. Uh, we always talk about this, this chicken and egg problem between uh, algorithm designers and, and hardware engineers. Uh, we have a lot of neuromorphic hardware, but there are no algorithms to, to run them on neuromorphic hardware. And when we have neuromorphic algorithms, we don't have uh, supporting hardware. Uh, which we hopefully will 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 rectify that. So thank you. That's 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 my talk. If you are interested, uh, check out check out uh, latest offering of Masters of Neuromorphic Engineering. Uh, you can do it part time or or, or full time. Um, we've just recently launched it. It is it's one of its kind uh, right now. Um, if you are interested, thank you so much. Thank you.